is the time to I'll share God's word this uh, morning and I'm thankful to Pastor uh, Hector for uh, giving me this uh, opportunity and uh, invited me to share God's word. So please turn with me to John chapter 17 and uh, I would like to read from verses 1 to 5. John chapter 17. The word of God says, After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in the presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I remember there was a pastor who was invited to preach in a church. And as he came and he was about to preach, there was a pulpit like this and there was a slip uh, on the pulpit. And it said, Blessed is the one who gives short sermon because he will be called again. Uh, I hope uh, you will invite me again. <laughs> now look, look at this uh, particular passage. It's a very important passage. But before I go into this theme, the theme is prayer. This is something very important and I think you are meditating on this subject of mission and prayer from the uh, last uh, few Sundays. And uh, as I, I was being informed that this, this is something very important uh, the power of prayer. It's very important. It's something uh, that is missing. It's something which is very important. And it's something that God always wants from us. And, and Satan doesn't want that we should be strong in prayer. He doesn't want that we should know the power of prayer. I remember there was a, there was a family, you know, and the father passed away already and there was a mother. And uh, she was on her deathbed and she was surrounded by her children and there was a four-year-old child who was also standing and you know uh, her last word uh, were very 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 touching and she said uh, to her children my children I have a great treasure for you and the children the children asked them what is it mother so she said she pointed out to the bird of God she said Seek it in the Bible. There you will find great treasure. I have watered every page with my tears. And after that, she died. Those words touched the heart of that little boy who was four years old. And, and then when he became uh, you know, young and then he graduated from the university, one thing he had in his heart was to serve God. And then he became a missionary to India, and his name was Barthelmew Ziegenbal. And when Ziegenbal came, he gave a motto uh, in India, and that was pray and work. Pray and work. So our life, God wants, expects us that we should not only pray, but our prayer life should also be seen in action. So somebody has said, if William Carey is the father of modern missions, then Bartholomew Zing Zingenbal is the father, grandfather of mission in India. So we praise God for such people, for such lives. There are so many missionaries who uh, came from different parts of the continents and served our country, and that's why we are so blessed. And our hearts rejoices. Really, our hearts are filled with thanksgiving that, yes, God has put something in your heart for India. And we know that God is doing remarkable things in spite of all persecution, in spite of all suffering, in spite of all pain. God is at work because there are people who are praying for India, includes home church. And we praise God for that. Someone has said beautifully, when men work, when men work, then men work. When men work, then men work. 
When men pray, God works. So we know that, that whatever you are doing here, you are praying for the mission, you are praying for the people, you are praying for the leaders, and I know that your prayers is a blessing for so many people around the world, and we praise God. In order to carry God's mission in this world, we need sincere partners who can stand with us and pray with us. And that's why God's word will grow. And prayer is something very, very important. And when we take prayer seriously in our lives, you know, things will be changed. Things will be definitely changed. There was one professor who came to Syax when I was a student. His name was Robert E. Coleman. And uh, he was a very good teacher. He was associate uh, evangelist with Dr. Billy Graham. And in his book, he writes that prayer shines through the Gospels like a dominant color in a painting given the whole picture of Christ, a characteristic hue. Beautifully. And if you, if you see the life of Jesus, it starts with prayer and ends with prayer as long as he was on this earth. And still he is interceding for us. And if you read the scriptures in different passages, you will find at the time of baptism, you will see him praying. At the time when he started his ministry, 40 days and 40 nights, he was praying. Before he selected the, the uh, disciples in Luke chapter 6, you know, he prayed before that. The transfiguration experience, you know, came because he prayed. While contemplating his impending death, he was praying. During the Last Supper, he was praying. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he was praying. And finally, the agony of the cross reminds the prayer of Jesus. And that was his life. And that's why he was able to accomplish what God has given to us, to him. And, and many times we fail in our lives because, because prayer lives become weak. We have to see that our prayer life is strong and that's why we will have that authority in our lives. And whatever we decide in the will of God, it we will see happening. That's, that's the power of prayer. I remember there's a very interesting illustration related to prayer. There was a pastor who served the church for so many years and he passed away. And when he went to the heaven, he was greeted by St. Peter's. And St. Peter said, oh, well, come, Pastor, wonderful to see you. Come. And, uh, and Pastor was very happy. He was getting a warm welcome to heaven. And uh, P Peter gave him uh, uh, some flour, and he put a shawl, you know, that Madam is having this shawl. So it's, a, it's an ordinary shawl he gave, and then he gave a, a flour, a rose to him. And while he was doing that, uh, they could hear a big sound. So, so this pastor was from India, and then, uh, then this, uh, you know, there was a big sound and, and joy, and then, and, and then he, he, the Peter, Peter, you know, he looked at that pastor, he said, wait, 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 there's something happening here, let me see what is happening. So there was a, like, a group of angels coming, and there was a bus driver who was coming with the angels. And, uh, and when Peter saw the bus driver, oh, wonderful, uh, Durai, you are here. <laughs> so he said, yes, yes, I'm here. And, and he put a garland and he gave him a very expensive shawl and gave him a very, very good welcome, grand welcome. And this pastor was standing and looking, what this Peter is doing here? Uh, when I came, it was just an ordinary shawl with the one, one rose of this thing, flower. And this fellow is coming, he's a, just a bus driver, and all sorts of, you know, welcome has been given, a grand welcome has been given. So that was something was there in his heart, and when everything was over, he went to Peter. He said, Peter, brother Peter, I've got something to say with you. He said, what? He said, see, when I came, you gave me this ordinary shawl, thank you for that, and also you gave me this flower. But that fellow, you know, was a bus driver, I know him, uh, he, he came and you gave him all sorts of welcome. He said, see, when you used to preach, people used to sleep. When he used to drive, people used to pray. <laughs> so my dear friends, prayer has power. <laughs> and uh, when somebody drives here, drives with me, uh, here and br brings me, I pray. <laughs> because when I see the speedometer, 
I get little, some, I get nervous. <laughs> okay, coming back to John chapter 17 now. This is something very important passage that I, we, want to, we want to highlight. John chapter 17 is Jesus' high priestly prayer. This is, some, this is the longest prayer of Jesus recorded in the Bible, in the New Testament. And if you read John chapter 17, it has three sections. Number one, Jesus prays for himself. Number two, Jesus prays for his disciples. And that number three, Jesus prays for the believers. He knows what is going to happen, what will happen when he dies with the disciples, and then what will happen when he will be resurrected and he will be with the Father, and he knew that all of us will be here listening God's word. So, so before he could leave the earth, he was praying. And he made this prayer a very significant prayer for, so that you know, we may be able to understand in fact, uh, John Knox, a Scottish reformer, during his illness, every day he used to ask his wife to read John chapter 17. And from that, he used to draw strength, spiritual strength, my dear friends. So my um, friends, when we look into this John chapter 17, it gives us challenge to all of us to pray for ourselves, to pray with whom we work, with our fam for our family members, and also for those who are believing in Jesus Christ, who believe in Jesus Christ, those who are in this city, those who are in the United States, and even beyond that. That's, that's the burden God has given to us. And here, Jesus reflects the troubled church of God, how much church will go through persecution. And that's why prayer is important. When I meet some older people uh, in the church, they say, oh, I want to do something for the Lord, but I'm not able to do it. I said, one thing that you can do is pray. When you intercede for people, when you intercede for your community, when you intercede people who are suffering, who, who, are, who are looking for life beyond this life, you will make a significant change in their lives through your prayers. And when you read the scripture, Jesus said here, uh, if it starts with after Jesus said this. What Jesus said this. In, if you look into John chapter 14, 15, and 16, Jesus mentions about the coming of the Holy Spirit. He was mentioning that do not, do not be afraid. Do not, let not your heart be troubled in John chapter 14. I'm going to send you a comforter. And the comforter, the, the, the word comforter comes from the, the meaning, the word parakletos. That means the one who comes and takes away our burden. Who envelops us. Who guards us, our hearts and mind with his peace. And that is the Holy Spirit. So now, not only Jesus talked about the coming of the Holy Spirit, but he is now praying that, Father, I am praying for to, that you glorify me. Father, I'm praying for the disciples and I'm praying for the believers. And here you see that it's a prayer where Jesus consecrates himself before entering into that suffering. And then you see after eight, in 18, Jesus was arrested. There are a few things that I want to share with you uh, this, this morning as we go in deep into this particular passage, the first thing is, if you turn with me to uh, John chapter 17, verse 2. And Jesus says, For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those who have given him. Jesus is praying that everyone should have eternal life. And that is the responsibility of the church, responsibility of the home church, that you should pray that many people in this world be saved, all people in this world be saved, and they may be blessed with eternal life. Eternal life was one of the subjects in this prayer that we should know. And we should also know that God is the source of eternal life. And, and he begins his prayer, Father, he looks at the heaven and says, Father, he connects himself with God the Father. We have Jesus Christ. 
And we are connected to the Father through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And whatever we ask our Father in the name of Jesus, it is given to us. And that claim, that promise that we have, we have to hold that promise in our lives. And here Jesus is saying that I am praying for the eternal life. And he is ready to die on the cross of Calvary in order to, to give eternal life people who are perishing. What is eternal life? If you read John chapter 17 verse 3, Jesus says, now this is eternal life. This is something very important. This is eternal life that they, they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. You see, there is one God, and this one God revealed himself in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We cannot separate God the Father from God the Son. Cannot happen. You see, the word God is inclusive. Many religions talk about that. God, God, God. But when we bring Jesus, they become, you know, it is difficult for them. Even for so many so-called Christians, they are started questioning about the, divinit uh, the divinity of Jesus Christ. But I want to tell you, we cannot separate God the Father from God the Son. We come to God the Father through God the Son. We know God through Jesus Christ. No one has revealed God. No one has seen God. It's only his begotten, Bible says in John chapter 1 verse 18. It's Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus is very important. And here the eternal life is when we believe in Jesus. When we believe in one God and, and that God has not sent somebody else. Remember this. He has sent only one person and that he became him. God and his son, Jesus Christ. He has sent his son and then he sent the Holy Spirit. He has not sent many other, uh, you know, human beings or others so that we start believing in them. No, not at all. Now, this is something very important is that Jesus is the solution of every problem. And it's, it, can ha it can only happen when we have that eternal life in our lives. And we have to believe. So the gift of eternal life enables believers to know God. If you want to know God, if you want to know the characteristics of God, if you want to know the attributes of God, it's only through Jesus Christ. And in Jesus Christ, when we talk about our relation with Jesus Christ, it is, it's three B's. Believe, belong, and behave. Believing in Jesus Christ belonging in Jesus Christ and behaving like Jesus Christ. The whole world is now looking on us. We talk about Jesus. But where Jesus is there, whether Jesus is there in our lives or not, that's a big question. People are looking Jesus in our lives. And the eternal life is 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 and 12. It says, he who has son has eternal life. You know, in India... Uh, when I was uh, pastoring a church in agriculture in, in the university, thousands of uh, villagers used to come and I used to pray for them along with other pastors. So one thing they used to say, Father, because they call us Father, no? Father or Pastor, Pastor Saab, Father, please pray. I have got five, six daughters. I need one son. <laughs> you, you, yeah, it's, you feel it's, 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 it's something humorous. But I tell you, Women are being tortured in India in many villages because they are not able to bear son for the family. For them, son is very important because son will give them identity. Son will give them the that, that their family may continue, the generation, the name. Name is very important. Name is important. Now, for us, son is also very important. <laughs> for us, this son is very important. If we talk about eternal life, if we want to be part of the kingdom of God. And the eternal life is this. And if we look at the data, 65 million, around 65 million people die every year. So many lives are being perishing. We don't know how many have attained eternal life, my dear friends. 
I was reading one data, it says 120 people die per minute. If I speak for 30 minutes, already 3,600 people died by this time. You can understand. It is the responsibility of the church to pray and to propagate the gospel so that people may attain eternal life. Hallelujah. Amen. Are you with me? Yes. If you look into Luke chapter 10, verse 1 and 2, uh, it says, Luke chapter 10, verse 1 and 2, it says, After this the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, this is something very important, he told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And then he says, ask the Lord of the harvest. What is asking? It's praying. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into this, his harvest field. If you combine Uttar Pradesh and Bihar together, the population is equal to the population of United States of India. I'm just talking about two states of India, where I come from. If you see my state, particular my state, Uttar Pradesh, if you combine the population of UK, France and Germany, it's equal to Uttar Pradesh. So you can understand how much people are suffering without eternal life. Bible talks about a man, young man, Luke chapter 18, verse 18 to 30. You can read at home, you know what that young man was. This young man came to Jesus and he asked Jesus in verse 18, Good teacher, what must I do to attain eternal life? Something very important question. You see, right question, right question, came to the right person, got the right answer, but took the wrong decision. Many a times, there are so many people who don't want to take eternal life. They don't take eternal life seriously. It's not the problem in India. It's problem is there everywhere in the world. And we need to pray that people may understand the importance of eternal life, abundant life. Second thing, he prays so that his disciples, and we all may be blessed with his joy. Turn with me to John chapter 17, verse 13. It says, I am coming to you now, but I say these things still, I am, I am still in the world, so that they may have full measure of joy with, within them. Full measure of joy within them. That's beautiful. The second thing, the first thing, Jesus wants that his people be blessed with eternal life. When the eternal life comes in, you know what comes? The joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord. And here the word of God says that, that the desire of Jesus, that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Full measure, not half, not quarter, not little, but full measure. You see, Jesus, when he, Jesus came into this world, what world gave to him? What world gave to him? No room when he was born. No place to lay his head. No people whom he can trust. Instead of love, he received hatred from the Pharisees. Instead of justice, he received the crown on his head. He received the nails on his palms and feet. Whips on his back, spanking on his face. This Jesus received. But man of sorrow is ready to fill us with his joy. Hallelujah. There was a woman who was uh, uh, trying to save the life of Scorpion in, from the Ganges River. And, the, and a man was passing by and she was trying to, to save the, the Scorpion. Was trying her best. And the man who saw, he, she saw for fip saw him saw her behind and from 15 minutes and then she he went to to that lady to that woman uh, what are you doing she said don't you see i'm trying to save the life of the scorpion he said you're trying to save the life of scorpion the nature of scorpion is to bite why are you doing that you know what she said she said a very remarkable thing 
She said the nature of the scorpion is to bite, but my nature is to save. You see, the nature, you see, when, when Jesus came into this world, people were after his life. They wanted to kill Jesus and they, they killed him. But Jesus came to save their life. And this is eternal life. You see, the word of God says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to full. He wants to fill us with his joy. You know, a cup overflows, Bible says in John, in, in, in uh, uh, Psalm 23. And he wants to fill us with his joy. Immeasurable. Cannot be measured. Psalm 16 verse 11 says, You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. When Nehemiah, you know, he was there to build the wall. You know what had happened? There were people against him. They never wanted that Nehemiah vision, which was God's vision, to be accomplished. They gave him legal notices. So many attacks are happening, you know, in India. They're trying to give legal notices to many Christian organizations. FCRAs, uh, they are closing the FCRA and all those problems are coming. But you know, Nehemiah trusted the Lord. And he encouraged his people. If you read Nehemiah chapter 4, he encouraged his people that they should not be afraid. They should trust in the Lord. And in Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10, he says, Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And I love this song. The joy of the Lord is my strength. 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 He gives me living water and I thirst no more. He gives me living water and I thirst no more. He gives me living water and I thirst no more. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The devil doesn't like me when we laugh, ha, ha. The devil doesn't like it when we laugh, ha, ha. The devil doesn't like it when we laugh, ha, ha. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Hallelujah. So this is, this is the joy that we should have in our lives. Whatever circumstances come, because there is someone who prayed for us and praying, his name is Jesus, and he wants to fill us with his joy. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Sometimes we feel, you know, in, in, in the mission field, many pastors feel what is going to happen. Things are becoming very odd. Circumstances that we are in, what is going to happen? But the word of God says, don't worry. There is a joy and the joy comes from the Lord. Psalm chapter 30 verse 11 and 12 says, you turn my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy and my heart may sing your praises. Billy Graham said, no matter how dark and hopeless a situation might seem, never stop praying. Amen. Never stop praying. The third thing, and then there's one more thing and then I'll finish. Don't worry. Uh, we'll, we, <laughs> blessed, he wants that we should be well protected. Jesus is praying for our protection. In verse 15, John chapter 17 verse 15 says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. You see, there are so many pastors in this world. There are so many mission workers. You know, they are like lamb among the wolves. We need to cover them in, their, in our prayers. We have our, this is a responsibility. When Jesus can pray for the disciples, why not you and I can pray for others who are in the mission field? Our young people need protection. How they will be protected? By prayer, through prayer. So that we have to know very carefully that yes, that Jesus is praying. If you, if you read, you will find that Jesus says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Protect them from the evil one. 1 John 5, 19 says, that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Many times, if you, if you, if you read uh, uh, throughout the Gospel of John, you will find three times uh, Jesus said that the world is under 
the rulership of Satan. The John chapter 12 verse 31, John chapter 14 verse 30, John chapter 16 verse 11, thrice Jesus mentioned in the gospel of John. But there is somebody who's praying for us. And that is, his name is Jesus. He has taught his disciples to pray. And that is prayer of deliverance. Lead us not into temptation when we pray our Lord's Prayer in Luke chapter 11. We need to pray because when we pray, you know, God's shield, God's protection, God is our rock. You know, He protects us from all evil attack. Bible says in Psalm chapter 23 verse 4, Even though I walk through the valley, darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. If anyone here is going through that dark valley, I am telling you, even in that dark valley, God's protection is there. He has not left you. He loves you. He takes care of you. We know that we have a God who is a living God. He saved Moses and whole Israel from the Egypt, Egyptians. He took Joseph out of the jail and made him the prime minister. He was with David when he killed Goliath. His hand was on David when Saul wanted to kill him. He saved Mordecai and the whole Jewish community from Haman's trap in the book of Esther. He was with Daniel and his friends in lion's den and when his friends were in, in, in that furnace, you know, God provided them protection. In, during the COVID times, I remember, we were all reading and trying to understand God's protection from Psalm 91. I have written an article on that. And such a beautiful psalm. You know, when we go through, through any trials and problems in life, the word of God speaks to us. Yes. Yes. For, for our lives, you know, that God is in control. And he takes care of our lives, my dear friends. You know, when, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 to 46, you know, he was praying. And one thing, one subject that he prayed and he, he was telling his disciple, watch and pray so that you may not fall into temptation. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Because we live in this evil world. Satan wants to destroy our lives. This world is good. God created this world. It's beautiful. But because Satan is trying to capture uh, the people, the hearts and minds of people, and that's why we have to be very careful. Satan is moving like a roaring lion. It's not a lion. The lion of Judah is only one. It's Jesus. You know, uh, we see Jesus as a lamb of God. When you remove that mask, you'll find lion of Judah. And the Satan wants to show himself like a, a powerful beast or, a, or, a, or a, like a lion. But if you remove that mask, you'll find a rat in him. This is the thing I want to share with you. In Luke chapter 22, verse 31, you know what Jesus is telling to Simon Peter? Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you. Many times temptation comes. Many times temptation comes in my life. But I know that God is there to protect me. People like you are praying. And we are all covered in the blood of Jesus. The last thing, and this, this is something uh, very important, and then I will close. If you turn with me to John chapter 17, verse 22, it says, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. See, the desire of Jesus is the desire of God the Father. And that's the desire of the Holy Spirit. And that desire is that we should be one with the triune God. That's the desire. You know, it starts with eternal life. When we receive eternal life, we are blessed with eternal life. And the joy of the Lord comes in our lives. When we are filled with joy and we want to spread God's word, Satan is there to attack us. And there is a protection, there is a hedge around us. And, and the ultimate desire is that we should become like 
Jesus. And that only happens when we allow him to come in, my, in our lives. I remember when I was 12 years old, we used to go to Allahabad Bible Seminary uh, in Allahabad. And preacher, American preacher was preaching. And he shared about uh, giving the life to Jesus. At the age of 12, when that song, that beautiful song uh, was played, Into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. I was sitting, the Lord spoke to me, and I went ahead. At the age of 12, and now I am 43, I have not looked back. And I have, never I have no regrets, because the joy of the Lord is with me. And I'm part of, the tr of that family triune God. Jesus wants that we should live in unity. We should live in harmony. There was a very uh, famous uh, God servant, church leader, Ignatius. When he was taken uh, to Rome as a prisoner to be beheaded for martyrdom, you know what happened? He prayed one thing. Lord, I pray that my people should become one. And then you accept my sacrifice. This was his prayer, that we all, the church, should become one. And, and, and Satan wants to bring division. We become one in him through this prayer. Unity with God and unity with other believers is very, very important. When we participate in the Holy Communion, you know, we all become one. We are the bride of Christ. We are not brides, remember that. We are bride of Christ. We are, the, we are not bodies of Christ. We are body of Christ. And that shows that how we are, we are there in his life. We want that we should be one, my dear friends. Psalm 133, verse 1 says, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is a time for us to be united. If we really want that, the, that, that we want to show Satan the door, we should be united. If we want to throw him out, we should be united. And God wants that the unity which he is praying is a unity of love. Unity of love. There is one beautiful commandment that love one another. Beautiful commandment. And the mandate, that's the mandate that we read in John chapter 13. And that's when we love one another, then we will, people will know that we are the disciples of Lord Jesus Christ. And this confirmation, public confirmation, our relationship with the Lord and relation with the Father and relationship with each other should be seen. And great armies, you know, great ba battles we will win if we are together. And church has to be very serious in the light of, in the, light of the present persecution that is happening. We are thankful to God that God has called us to be united. If we want to remove the darkness, we want that the light should spread all over the world. Be united. Be united. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Amen. So with this note, I want to share that the th four things that Jesus wants us to know as we pray. We need to pray for the eternal life, those who are lost. We need to pray that people may find joy in his presence. He wants that we should be protected from the evil one and others should be protected from evil one. And he wants that we should, we should live in unity. You know, Bible says that we are the temple of God. Hmm? Bible says we are the temple of God and Holy Spirit dwells in us. And when you read uh, Revelation chapter 22, the word of God says, there will be no temple because the Lamb will be our temple. Today we are His temple and when we will be with Him, He will be our temple. What a union, what a unity Bible talks about. Let us, let us focus on Jesus who is the author and finisher of our faith. He will bless us. He will guard us and guide us. Let us look our Lord in prayer. Let's bow down our heads in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful to you that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, into this world. 
Thank you, Jesus, for this beautiful prayer, the high priestly prayer you prayed so that we may attain eternal life, we may attain your joy, we may attain the protection, and we may live in unity and harmony. Lord, I pray for this home church that you bless the pastor, bless the leaders here, bless all the congregation members. I pray all those who are sitting here, they have different needs and requirements, spiritual requirements, physical requirements. Lord, I know that you have spoken to them and you are going to bless them, Lord. You are going to bless this church and this church will be a great blessing for many, many nations, Lord, in the days to come. Lord, I pray that you bless all of us. I am thankful for the partnership, the collaboration that we have with the home church, Caleb Institute. Our hearts are filled with joy. And I pray, Lord, that you bless them, bless their efforts, bless the seed that they are sowing there in India. And we know, Lord, in the days to come, greater things are going to happen, Lord, for the extension of your kingdom in India and around. We give you honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.